Recently, there was an amber alert and my daughter was asking me what that beeping sound was all about. For those who don't know, an amber alert goes out when a child is reported missing. If you receive notifications, you know what I'm talking about. The alert will sometimes give information like the victim's appearance as well as the perpetrator, the location of the abduction, make and model of vehicle. My phone started beeping one evening while helping my daughter clean her room. An amber alert. She asked about it. I gave her a small rundown and that was that. However, it triggered a childhood memory I have where I believe with all my heart that I was almost kidnapped when I was a kid. To be clear, this isn't a memory that was laying dormant in my subconscious. And this random amber alert and talk with my kid caused it to resurface in my mind. This incident is something I've pondered and thought about off and on for years now. I'm a 41 year old male by the way. It's just been a while since I've considered the factors and details of the experience. And this recent amber alert and talk with my daughter really caused me to pause and reflect on the incident itself once again, and here I am. As a parent, you worry about these things and do all you can to protect your children, especially when you personally experienced something truly scary like this. The occurrence happened when I was just a young kid. My guess is around seven or eight. I can't be sure, but I think that's a safe estimate based on the fact that much of those early childhood memories aren't there anymore. I do remember my kindergarten experience, which I would have been five or six and also later grades. So this incident must have happened sometime after or around the ages of seven or eight. My parents took me to a neighboring city to do some shopping. We lived in a small rural town with not much on offer so from time to time we would go to this neighboring city about 45 minutes from where we were located. It just had more to offer. They would take me up there for school clothes shopping, out to eat because restaurants were better, and because my mom was a crafter. She loved to make crafts, it was her thing. There were different craft stores and a fabric store she liked going to up there. This specific trip we went to a fabric store up there, Joanne Fabrics to be exact. This was a pretty big store. As a little kid, I guess most every place seems big, but no kidding, this was a sizable store. My dad sat out in the car while I went in with my mom. He did that a lot, sit in the car when there was a store he just didn't want to go in, so I can't blame him there. I can't recall exactly what all my mom was looking for or trying to get in that store that day, but I do remember what section we were in, an area with a bunch of racks with various fabrics hanging. Imagine a clothing store with circular racks with clothes hanging around them, and that's pretty much what it's like at this fabric store, racks of hanging fabrics. I remember this area being slightly toward the beginning or entrance of the store. As my mom was looking through these racks, I begin to wander, though not far, just enough to kind of look around myself. I was probably bored and started wandering around is my guess, but I could still see my mom just up and over a few racks away, so it wasn't like I was on the other side of the store or anything. A random man approached me and honestly I can't even remember at what direction he came from. It's just like I was there by myself one minute and the next. I looked up and saw this guy. It was like he came in fast and out of nowhere. I quickly looked over to where my mom was. She had moved a few racks up and away, but I could still see her. There was a fair bit of distance between my mom and me at this point. So here I am standing behind some rack of fabric with this older guy opposite me on the other side of this rack. Then he speaks. Hey little boy, how you doing there? I remained silent because this took me completely off guard. He asked, where's your folks at? Are you alone in here? I stood still and quiet. Come here, I got something to show you. At this point he started advancing toward me, coming around the rack to where I was. 
I quickly started the other way but he stopped and started coming around the other way as if to meet me in the middle. I was scared at this moment and became instantly aware that this man seemed dangerous and like he was trying to get a hold of me. Come here, he barked. I jerked fast to the left but he did the same. He had this wild look in his eyes. Whichever direction I went he followed. But remember, there's a rack between us. God, I'm so thankful for that rack. After some back and forth movements from me and this man, I finally lock in on my mom and yell, Mom, help! You would have thought I screamed bloody murder. It was so loud, but it got my mom's attention. What's wrong? She asked. This startled the man and he looked over his shoulder in the direction of my gaze and confirmed. Yep, that must be his mother. His demeanor completely changes and it's as if everything is just fun and games and he was just messing around and he said as much to my mom. I was just messing around with him. No harm, ma'am. My mom came to where I was and as we reconnected, the guy just tips his hat at my mom and makes his way out of the store. I explained to my mom what just happened that this guy was trying to get me, I was so upset and shook up. She told me I did the right thing by yelling and getting her attention. It was terrifying for sure and I'm thankful something crazy didn't happen. Could I have been imagining things like, maybe this guy was really just messing around? I very much think there were nefarious intentions. Why would a random older guy be perusing a fabric store? If he was there for something like crafts or fabrics, why promptly leave when confronted? I truly believe he was up to no good. Anyway, that's my story. I appreciate anyone taking the time to read. This happened when my sister and I were around 6 and 8. My sister is now 43, I'm now 45, and it is something that still haunts us occasionally. We had an amazing municipal swimming pool in our neighborhood. South African summers in Johannesburg are hot and long. The swimming pool was the ultimate destination. Joe was that adult that was always at the pool. He would swim lengths, practice diving, and tickle our feet under the water. Just typing this makes me feel nauseous. To this day, I still have issues with my feet being wet. Specifically, I am unable to leave cream on my feet. The sliminess makes me claustrophobic. I only realized the connection last year. Whenever we would sit on the edge of the pool with our feet hanging in, he would swim past all of us and tickle all our feet in a row. I can't remember all the details 100%, but someone playfully screamed, Oh no, Joe! And Joe did it again and sang, Oh no, Joe, not again, Joe. We all laughed as kids do. Then he tickled our feet again and made us sing his new song. Oh no, Joe, not again, Joe. It became a game. He would grab us under the water and we would sing. It went from feet tickling to chasing us and grabbing our waist under the water. Oh no, Joe, not again, Joe. That song never goes away. One day at the pool, Joe tells us he has this amazing farm just out of town. He would like to take us to see his animals, his corn, and his own swimming pool. It sounded like heaven to all of us. He was talking to several children, boys and girls. He told us to be at the swimming pool on Saturday, but not to tell our parents. We will go in his car. As soon as we get home, we tell our dad everything. We are so excited. This farm sounds amazing. Our dad says, absolutely not. Who is Joe anyway? We tell him that Joe is our friend at the pool and plays with our feet and chases us around the pool. My dad says that actually, maybe we can go, but he wants to meet Joe first. Yay. The next day we go to the pool and we tell Joe we can go with him, but our dad wants to meet him first. Joe is upset that we told our dad, but we tell him not to worry. Our dad is cool. 
So Joe walks home with us. We only lived about five blocks from the pool and comes to meet our dad. Joe is about five foot six or 1.7 meters. My dad is six foot seven, just over two meters. The personification of a gentle giant. My dad is super polite to Joe. He asks him loads of questions about the farm. Where is it exactly? How many kids are going? Has he spoken to other parents? Joe was cool as a cucumber. He answered the question smoothly and confidently. My dad ended by saying, Joe, I look forward to seeing you on Saturday at your farm. I think we will have a great time. I will bring my girls though and we will meet you there. The next part is a bit of a blur for me. I am not sure how we ended up driving in convoy with about three other dads and their kids from the pool. It was so exciting. My dad had the map book, leading the convoy to the best farm in the world. We drove about an hour out of town and we arrive at the derelict farmhouse. No animals, no corn, no swimming pool. Just this rundown, isolated, scary looking farmhouse in the middle of nowhere. I remember being really confused. My dad must have read the map book wrong. All the dads huddle together. We have no idea what they are saying, but they are angry. We are also angry, we are obviously lost, and it is the dad's fault. Everyone gets in their cars, and I start screaming at my dad about how he deliberately got us lost because he doesn't like Joe and he didn't want us to have fun. My dad is silent and pensive. After my tantrum, he says to my sister and I in a very calm, deep voice, Joe is a bad man. He was going to hurt all of you. He is the bad man your mom is always warning you about. My mother is obsessed with true crime. There is no farm. I am so happy you girls told me what was going on because something bad could have happened to you. His strong voice broke in those last words. The gravity of his tone and the break in his voice made my sister and I realize immediately that he was right and we were in danger. We cried and apologized. He made us promise to tell him if we saw Joe again. Joe stayed away from the pool for about a month. As soon as we saw him come through the gate, we quickly got dressed and ran home. When my dad came home from golf, we told him Joe was at the pool again. The next day we went to the pool with our dad. We were swimming and my dad was sitting on one of the benches to the side. In walks Joe. He comes to the edge of pool and is calling us. We refuse to go to the edge. He is getting frustrated. My dad gets up and comes up to Joe. Hey buddy, can I chat to you outside quickly? Joe physically shrunk. My dad had his hand on Joe's shoulder and was guiding him up the pool. I can only imagine what my dad did and said to Joe. My dad is a gentleman, but don't mess with his girls. Joe was never seen again at our swimming pool. I work a long commute away from home and depend on the train. There were some issues that caused the trains to be cancelled for hours which left me stranded about one and a half hours drive from home. At the train station there were a few others who were all heading to my city and we decided to split a taxi. The people were... Woman 1 will call her Lisa. She's heading to my city to see a gig. Was a bit tipsy. Man 1 will call him Kyle. Traveling with Lisa. They're not dating, but from their conversation seemed like friends or friends with benefits. He was beyond drunk, and it made me a bit uncomfortable because he was peeing in a bush and kept making vulgar comments about Lisa's hot cousin. Man too, we'll call him John. He was traveling alone and mentioned that he lived in my city. He just moved there, but was in that town we were leaving from as he just broke up with his girlfriend, and was picking stuff up from her place. Woman 2, who I'll mention later. Woman 2 decides to stay at her mother's house in the town for another evening, 
so drops out of the taxi ride. That should have been my cue to also drop out, but they had just rung the taxi and so I didn't want to ruin it as they already calculated how much we all need to pay. I decided to ask Lisa if I could sit next to her in the taxi. She said, I completely understand, come on, I'll sit in the middle. So the seating arrangement was Kyle sat at the front, me sitting on the side and Lisa sat in the middle. It came time for John to get in the taxi. Mind you, from where we were parked, there was no danger to getting in from the other side, as there were no oncoming cars. He opened the door on my side and just stared at me. Then Lisa says cheerfully for him to sit the other side, as she wanted a middle seat to talk to Kyle more easily. John stared at us for about a second more, then scoffed and slowly walked over to the other side and got in. The ride itself was awkward as Lisa and Kyle were both drunk and dirty laundry was aired, which is how I know that they were friends with benefits. Lisa was drinking still before she finally said she needed to go to the toilet and was desperate. Taxi man found a public leisure center for him to pull into. She got out and went inside. Mistake number two, I should have went with her, but I just didn't think about it. Normally, I go with female friends in restaurants or bars, but because it was a taxi and freezing outside, I just stayed. Kyle and John went outside the taxi to smoke a cigarette. Then John came back in when we saw Lisa coming out. He scooted over to the middle, then put his hand on my upper thigh and rested it there. Regret number three. I should have said something and made a scene, but I just froze completely. Lisa opened the door, looked at John and looked at me. Then looked at John's hand on my upper thigh, two inches away from my vagina. She cheerfully said to him, Oh, I'm so sorry. Can we please switch? I love sitting middle. John looked pissed. He looked over at me, still frozen, removed his hand from my thigh and scooted out to make room for her. He grumbled something I couldn't hear before. Lisa said, Thank you, and came in next to me. John sat in his proper seat this time and we took off. Lisa then took my hand and whispered to me, Woman to woman, I'll make sure you get home safely. I was just tearing up and said thank you. Then, throughout the journey about four or five times after Lisa has leaned forward to speak to Kyle, John slipped his hand to her seat, so when she sat back down, he would touch her ass. Every time she just giggled and said, Oh, sorry, I think I sat on your hand then. I felt awful because she was in this position because of me. So I apologized and she just repeated that. She'll get me home safely, woman to woman. She was very drunk at this point from the extra taxi drinking, so I think she just latched onto that mission. When we got close to the city center, Lisa asked where I needed to get to and I told her the general area. John said he moved to an area that is literally in the opposite direction. His suburb is north, I'm south of the city center. He said after Kyle and Lisa got out, we'll share a taxi together, despite that making no sense as we lived in opposite directions. I said no, that's fine, but he was insistent. Won't take no for an answer. Lisa was too drunk and crying about how much she loves her dog at this point to protect me. I texted my husband that I was terrified and if he could walk up to come get me. My husband fricking booked it over as fast as he could. After we got out of the taxi, John was getting his bags out of the trunk and I said bye to Lisa and just ran as fast as I could to make it to my husband. We say it all the time, but it needs to be said again. Forget being polite when you feel scared. John probably latched onto me because I was traveling along while Lisa was with a man. Also, Lisa is right. Girls need to stick together. I should have gone to the toilet with her.